Part two of Chapter twenty four of Women in Love. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. The second part of Chapter twenty four Death and Love. When Gudrun heard that Mr. Cry was dead, she felt rebuked. She had stayed away lest Gerald should think her too easy of winning, and now he was in the midst of trouble, whilst she was cold. The following day she went up as usual to Winifred, who was glad to see her, glad to get away into the studio. The girl had wept, and then, too frightened, had turned aside to avoid any more tragic eventuality. She and Gudrun resumed work as usual in the isolation of the studio, and this seemed an immeasurable happiness, a pure world of freedom after the aimlessness and misery of the house. Gudrun stayed on till evening. She and Winifred had dinner brought up to the studio, where they ate in freedom, away from all the people in the house. After dinner Gerald came up. The great high studio was full of shadow and a fragrance of coffee. Gudrun and Winifred had a little table near the fire at the far end, with a white lamp whose light did not travel far. They were a tiny world to themselves, the two girls surrounded by lovely shadows, the beams and rafters shadowy overhead the benches and implements shadowy down the studio. "'You're cosy enough here,' said Gerald, going up to them. There was a low brick fireplace full of fire, an old blue Turkish rug, the little oak table with the lamp and the white and blue cloth and the dessert, and Gudrun making coffee in an odd brass coffee-maker, and Winifred scalding a little milk in a tiny saucepan. "'Have you had coffee?' said Gudrun. "'I have, but I'll have some more with you,' he replied. "'Then you must have it in a glass. There are only two cups,' said Winifred. "'It's the same to me,' he said, taking a chair and coming into the charmed circle of the girls. How happy they were! How cosy and glamorous it was with them in a world of lofty shadows!' The outside world, in which she had been transacting funeral business all the day, was completely wiped out. In an instant he snuffed glamour and magic. They had all their things very dainty, two odd and lovely little cups, scarlet and solid gilt, and a little black jug with scarlet discs, and the curious coffee machine whose spirit flame flowed steadily almost invisibly. There was the effect of rather sinister richness, in which Gerald at once escaped himself. They all sat down, and Gudrun carefully poured out the coffee. "'Will you have milk?' she asked calmly, yet nervously poising the little black jug with its big red dots. She was always so completely controlled yet so bitterly nervous. "'No, I won't,' he replied. So, with a curious humility, she placed him the little cup of coffee, and herself took the awkward tumbler. She seemed to want to serve him. "'Why don't you give me the glass? It's so clumsy for you,' he said. He would much rather have had it, and seen her daintily served, but she was silent, pleased with the disparity, with her self-abasement. "'You're quite en ménage,' he said. "'Yes, we aren't really at home to visitors,' said Winifred. "'You're not. Then I'm an intruder.' For once he felt his conventional dress was out of place. He was an outsider. Gudrun was very quiet. She did not feel drawn to talk to him. At this stage silence was best, or mere light words. It was best to leave serious things aside. 
So they talked gaily and lightly, till they heard the man below lead out the horse, and call it to back, back, into the dog-cart that was to take Gudrun home. So she put on her things, and shook hands with Gerald, without once meeting his eyes, and she was gone. The funeral was detestable. Afterwards, at the tea-table, the daughters kept saying, "'He was a good father to us, the best father in the world,' or else, "'We shan't easily find another man as good as father was.' Gerald acquiesced in all this. It was the right conventional attitude, and as far as the world went he believed in the conventions. He took it as a matter of course. But Winifred hated everything, and hid in the studio, and cried her heart out, and wished Gudrun would come. Luckily everybody was going away. The cries never stayed long at home. By dinner-time Gerald was left quite alone. Even Winifred was carried off to London for a few days with her sister Laura. But when Gerald was really left alone, he could not bear it. One day passed by, and another, and all the time he was like a man hung in chains over the edge of an abyss. Struggle as he might, he could not turn himself to the solid earth, he could not get footing. He was suspended on the edge of a void, writhing. Whatever he thought of was the abyss, whether it were friends, or strangers, or work, or play, it all showed him only the same bottomless void, in which his heart swung, perishing. There was no escape, there was nothing to grasp hold of. He must writhe on the edge of the chasm, suspended in chains of invisible physical life. At first he was quiet, he kept still, expecting the extremity to pass away expecting to find himself released into the world of the living, after this extremity of penance. But it did not pass, and a crisis gained upon him. As the evening of the third day came on, his heart rang with fear. He could not bear another night. Another night was coming on. For another night he was to be suspended in chain of physical life over the bottomless pit of nothingness. And he could not bear it. He could not bear it. He was frightened deeply and coldly, frightened in his soul. He did not believe in his own strength any more. He could not fall into this infinite void and rise again. If he fell he would be gone for ever. He must withdraw, he must seek reinforcements. He did not believe in his own single self any further than this. After dinner, faced with the ultimate experience of his own nothingness, he turned aside. He pulled on his boots, put on his coat, and set out to walk in the night. It was dark and misty. He went through the wood stumbling and feeling his way to the mill. Birkin was away. Good! He was half glad. He turned up the hill, and stumbled blindly over the wild slopes, having lost the path in the complete darkness. It was boring. Where was he going? No matter. He stumbled on till he came to a path again. Then he went on through another wood, his mind became dark, he went on automatically. Without thought or sensation he stumbled unevenly on, out into the open again, fumbling for stiles, losing the path, and going along the hedges of the fields till he came to the outlet. And at last he came to the high road. It had distracted him to struggle blindly through the maze of darkness. But now he must take a direction, and he did not even know where he was, but he must take a direction now. Nothing would be resolved by merely walking, walking away. He had to take a direction. He stood still on the road, 
that was high in the utterly dark night, and he did not know where he was. It was a strange sensation, his heart beating, and ringed round with the utterly unknown darkness. So he stood for some time. Then he heard footsteps, and saw a small swinging light. He immediately went towards this. It was a miner. "'Can you tell me,' he said, "'where this road goes?' "'Road? Aye, goes to Watmore.' "'Watmore? Oh, thank you. That's right. I thought I was wrong. Good night.' "'Good night,' replied the broad voice of the miner. Gerald guessed where he was. At least, when he came to Watmore he would know. He was glad to be on a high road. He walked forward, as in a sleep of decision. That was Watmore Village. Yes, the King's Head, and there the Hall Gates. He descended the steep hill, almost running. Winding through the hollow, he passed the grammar school, and came to Willie Green Church. The churchyard! He halted. Then, in another moment, he had clambered up the wall, and was going among the graves. Even in this darkness he could see the heaped pallor of old white flowers at his feet. This, then, was the grave. He stooped down. The flowers were cold and clammy. There was a raw scent of chrysanthemums and tube-roses, deadened. He felt the clay beneath, and shrank. It was so horribly cold and sticky. He stood away in revulsion. Here was one centre, then, here in the complete darkness beside the unseen raw grave. But there was nothing for him here. No, he had nothing to stay here for. He felt as if some of the clay were sticking cold and unclean on his heart. No, enough of this. Where, then? Home? Never. It was no use going there. That was less than no use. It could not be done. There was somewhere else to go. Where? A dangerous resolve formed in his heart, like a fixed idea. There was Gudrun. She would be safe in her home. But he could get at her. He would get at her. He would not go back to-night, till he had come to her, if it cost him his life. He staked his all on this throw. He set off, walking straight across the fields towards Beldover. It was so dark nobody could ever see him. His feet were wet and cold, heavy with clay. But he went on, persistently, like a wind, straight forward as if to his fate. There were great gaps in his consciousness. He was conscious that he was at Winthorpe Hamlet, but quite unconscious how he had got there. And then, as in a dream, he was in the long street of Beldover, with its street lamps. There was a noise of voices, and of a door shutting loudly, and being barred, and of men talking in the night. The Lord Nelson had just closed, and the drinkers were going home. He had better ask one of these where she lived, for he did not know the side streets at all. "'Can you tell me where Somerset Drive is?' he asked of one of the uneven men. "'Where what?' replied the tipsy miner's voice. "'Somerset Drive!' "'Somerset Drive! I've heard of such a place, but I couldn't for my life say where it is. Who might you be wanting?' Mr. Brangwen, William Brangwen. William Brangwen. Who teaches at the grammar school, at Willie Green. His daughter teaches there, too. Oh, Brangwen. Now I've got you. Of course, William Brangwen. Yes, yes, he's got two lasses as teachers, aside himself. Ah, that's him, that's him. Why, certainly I know where he lives. Back your life I do. Yeah, what place they call it? Somerset Drive, 
repeated Gerald patiently. He knew his own colliers fairly well. "'Somerset Drive, for certain,' said the collier, swinging his arm as if catching something up. "'Somerset Drive, yeah. I couldn't for my life lay hold of the locality of the place. Yes, I know the place, to be sure I do.' He turned unsteadily on his feet, and pointed up the dark, nigh-deserted road. You go up there, and you take the first, yeah, the first turning on your left, on that side, past Withams's Tuffy shop. I know, said Gerald. Aye. You go down a bit, past where the waterman lives, and then Somerset Drive, as they call it, branches off to right hand side. And there's nought but three houses in it, no more than three, I believe. And I'm almost certain there's the last, the last of the three. See? Thank you very much, said Gerald. Good night. And he started off, leaving the tipsy man there standing rooted. Gerald went past the dark shops and houses, most of them sleeping now and twisted round to the little blind road that ended on a field of darkness. He slowed down as he neared his goal, not knowing how he should proceed. What if the house were closed in darkness? But it was not. He saw a big lighted window, and heard voices. Then a gate banged. His quick ears caught the sound of Birkin's voice. His keen eyes made out Birkin, with Ursula standing in a pale dress on the step of the garden path. Then Ursula stepped down, and came along the road, holding Birkin's arm. Gerald went across into the darkness, and they dawdled past him, talking happily, Birkin's voice low, Ursula's high and distinct. Gerald went quickly to the house. The blinds were drawn before the big lighted window of the dining-room. Looking up the path at the side, he could see the door left open, shedding a soft coloured light from the hall lamp. He went quickly and silently up the path, and looked up into the hall. There were pictures on the walls, and the antlers of a stag, and the stairs going up on one side, and just near the foot of the stairs the half-opened door of the dining-room. With heart drawn fine, Gerald stepped into the hall, whose floor was of coloured tiles, went quickly and looked into the large pleasant room. In a chair by the fire the father sat asleep, his head tilted back against the side of the big oak chimney-piece, his ruddy face seen foreshortened, the nostrils open, the mouth fallen a little. It would take the merest sound to wake him. Gerald stood a second, suspended. He glanced down the passage behind him. It was all dark. Again he was suspended. Then he went swiftly upstairs. His senses were so finely, almost supernaturally keen, that he seemed to cast his own will over the half-unconscious house. He came to the first landing. There he stood, scarcely breathing. Again, corresponding to the door below, there was a door again. That would be the mother's room. He could hear her moving about in the candlelight. She would be expecting her husband to come up. He looked along the dark landing. Then, silently, on infinitely careful feet, he went along the passage feeling the wall with the extreme tips of his fingers. There was a door. He stood and listened. He could hear two people's breathing. It was not that. He went stealthily forward. There was another door, slightly open. The room was in darkness, empty. Then there was the bathroom. He could smell the soap and the heat. Then at the end another bedroom, one soft breathing. This was she. 
With an almost occult carefulness he turned the door-handle and opened the door an inch. It creaked slightly. Then he opened it another inch, then another. His heart did not beat. He seemed to create a silence about himself, an obliviousness. He was in the room. Still the sleeper breathed softly. It was very dark. He felt his way forward inch by inch with his feet and hands. He touched the bed. He could hear the sleeper. He drew nearer, bending close, as if his eyes would disclose whatever there was. And then, very near to his face, to his fear, he saw the round, dark head of a boy. He recovered, turned round, saw the door ajar, a faint light revealed, and he retreated swiftly, drew the door to without fastening it, and passed rapidly down the passage. At the head of the stairs he hesitated. There was still time to flee. But it was unthinkable. He would maintain his will. He turned past the door of the parental bedroom like a shadow, and was climbing the second flight of stairs. They creaked under his weight. It was exasperating. Ah! What disaster if the mother's door opened just beneath him, and she saw him! It would have to be, if it were so. He held the control still. He was not quite up these stairs when he heard a quick running of feet below. The outer door was closed and locked. He heard Ursula's voice, then the father's sleepy exclamation. He pressed on swiftly to the upper landing. Again a door was ajar, a room was empty. Feeling his way forward with the tips of his fingers, travelling rapidly like a blind man, anxious lest Ursula should come upstairs, he found another door. There, with his preternaturally fine sense alert, he listened. He heard someone moving in bed. This would be she. Softly now, like one who has only one sense, the tactile sense, he turned the latch. It clicked. He held still. The bedclothes rustled. His heart did not beat. Then again he drew the latch back, and very gently pushed the door. It made a sticking noise as it gave. Ursula, said Gudrun's voice, frightened. He quickly opened the door and pushed it behind him. Is it you, Ursula? came Gudrun's frightened voice. He heard her sitting up in bed. In another moment she would scream. No, it's me, he said, feeling his way towards her. It is I, Gerald. She sat motionless in her bed, in sheer astonishment. She was too astonished, too much taken by surprise, even to be afraid. "'Gerald!' she echoed, in blank amazement. He had found his way to the bed, and his outstretched hand touched her warm breast blindly. She shrank away. "'Let me make a light,' she said, springing out. He stood perfectly motionless. He heard her touch the matchbox. He heard her fingers in their movement. Then he saw her in the light of a match, which she held to the candle. The light rose in the room, then sank to a small dimness as the flame sank down on the candle before it mounted again. She looked at him as he stood near the other side of the bed. His cap was pulled low over his brow, his black overcoat was buttoned close up to his chin, his face was strange and luminous. He was inevitable as a supernatural being. When she had seen him, she knew. She knew there was something fatal in the situation, and she must accept it. Yet she must challenge him. "'How did you come up?' she asked. I walked up the stairs. The door was open. She looked at him. I haven't closed this door, either, he said. She walked swiftly across the room and closed her door softly, and locked it. 
Then she came back. She was wonderful, with startled eyes and flushed cheeks, and her plait of hair rather short and thick down her back, and her long, fine white nightdress falling to her feet. She saw that his boots were all clay, even his trousers were plastered with clay, and she wondered if he had made footprints all the way up. He was a very strange figure, standing in her bedroom near the tossed bed. "'Why have you come?' she asked, almost querulous. "'I wanted to,' he replied. And this she could see from his face. It was fate. "'You are so muddy,' she said, in distaste, but gently. He looked down at his feet. "'I was walking in the dark.' he replied. But he felt vividly elated. There was a pause. He stood on one side of the tumbled bed, she on the other. He did not even take his cap from his brows. "'And what do you want of me?' she challenged. He looked aside and did not answer. Save for the extreme beauty and mystic attractiveness of this distinct, strange face, she would have sent him away. But his face was too wonderful and undiscovered to her. It fascinated her with the fascination of pure beauty, cast a spell on her, like nostalgia, an ache. "'What do you want of me?' she repeated, in an estranged voice. He pulled off his cap in a movement of dream liberation, and went across to her. But he could not touch her, because she stood barefoot in her nightdress, and he was muddy and damp. Her eyes, wide and large and wondering, watched him, and asked him the ultimate question. "'I came because I must,' he said. "'Why do you ask?' She looked at him in doubt and wonder. "'I must ask,' she said. He shook his head slightly. "'There is no answer,' he replied, with strange vacancy. There was about him a curious and almost godlike air of simplicity and naive directness. He reminded her of an apparition, the young Hermes. "'But why did you come to me?' she persisted. "'Because it has to be so. If there weren't you in the world, then I shouldn't be in the world either.' She stood looking at him with large, wide, wondering, stricken eyes. His eyes were looking steadily into hers all the time, and he seemed fixed in an odd supernatural steadfastness. She sighed. She was lost now. She had no choice. "'Won't you take off your boots?' she said. "'They must be wet.' He dropped his cap on a chair, unbuttoned his overcoat, lifting up his chin to unfasten the throat-buttons. His short, keen hair was ruffled. He was so beautifully blonde, like wheat. He pulled off his overcoat. Quickly he pulled off his jacket, pulled loose his black tie, and was unfastening his studs which were headed each with a pearl. She listened, watching, hoping no one would hear the starched linen crackle. It seemed to snap like pistol-shots. He had come for vindication. She let him hold her in his arms, clasp her close against him. He found in her an infinite relief. Into her he poured all his pent-up darkness and corrosive death, and he was whole again. It was wonderful, marvellous. It was a miracle. This was the ever-recurrent miracle of his life, 
at the knowledge of which he was lost in an ecstasy of relief and wonder, and she, subject, received him as a vessel filled with his bitter potion of death. She had no power at this crisis to resist. The terrible frictional violence of death filled her, and she received it in an ecstasy of subjection, in throes of acute, violent sensation. As he drew nearer to her, he plunged deeper into her enveloping soft warmth, a wonderful, creative heat that penetrated his veins and gave him life again. He felt himself dissolving and sinking to rest in the bath of her living strength. It seemed as if her heart in her breast were a second unconquerable sun, into the glow and creative strength of which he plunged further and further. All his veins that were murdered and lacerated healed softly as life came pulsing in, stealing invisibly into him, as if it were the all-powerful effluence of the sun. His blood, which seemed to have been drawn back into death, came ebbing on the return, surely, beautifully, powerfully. She felt his limbs growing fuller and flexible with life, his body gained an unknown strength, he was a man again, strong and rounded. And he was a child, so soothed and restored, and full of gratitude. And she? She was the great bath of life, he worshipped her. Mother and substance of all life she was. And he, child and man, received of her, and was made whole. His pure body was almost killed, but the miraculous soft effluence of her breast suffused over him, over his seared, damaged brain, like a healing lymph, like a soft, soothing flow of life itself, perfect, as if he were bathed in the womb again. His brain was hurt, seared, the tissue was as if destroyed. He had not known how hurt he was, how his tissue, the very tissue of his brain, was damaged by the corrosive flood of death. Now, as the healing lymph of her effluence flowed through him, he knew how destroyed he was, like a plant whose tissue is burst from inwards by a frost. He buried his small, hard head between her breasts, and pressed her breasts against him with his hands, and she, with quivering hands, pressed his head against her as he lay suffused out, and she lay fully conscious. The lovely, creative warmth flooded through him like a sleep of fecundity within the womb. Oh, if only she would grant him the flow of this living effluence, he would be restored, he would be complete again. He was afraid she would deny him before it was finished. Like a child at the breast, he cleaved intensely to her, and she could not put him away. And his seared, ruined membrane relaxed, softened. That which was seared and stiff and blasted, yielded again, became soft and flexible, palpitating with new life. He was infinitely grateful, as to God, or as an infant is at its mother's breast. He was glad and grateful like a delirium, as he felt his own wholeness come over him again as he felt the full, unutterable sleep coming over him, the sleep of complete exhaustion and restoration. But Gudrun lay wide awake, destroyed into perfect consciousness. She lay motionless, with wide eyes, staring motionless into the darkness, 
whilst he was sunk away in sleep, his arms round her. She seemed to be hearing waves break on a hidden shore, long, slow, gloomy waves, breaking with the rhythm of fate, so monotonously that it seemed eternal. This endless breaking of slow, sullen waves of fate held her life a possession, whilst she lay with dark, wide eyes looking into the darkness. She could see so far, as far as eternity, yet she saw nothing. She was suspended in perfect consciousness, and of what was she conscious? This mood of extremity, when she lay staring into eternity, utterly suspended, and conscious of everything to the last limits, passed and left her uneasy. She had lain so long motionless, she moved, she became self-conscious, she wanted to look at him, to see him. But she dared not make a light, because she knew he would wake, and she did not want to break his perfect sleep that she knew he had got of her. She disengaged herself softly, and rose up a little to look at him. There was a faint light, it seemed to her, in the room. She could just distinguish his features as he slept the perfect sleep. In this darkness she seemed to see him so distinctly. But he was far off, in another world. Ah, oh, she could shriek with torment! He was so far off, and perfected, in another world! She seemed to look at him as at a pebble, far away, under clear dark water. And here was she, left with all the anguish of consciousness, whilst he was sunk deep into the other element of mindless, remote, living shadow-gleam. He was beautiful, far off and perfected. They would never be together. Ah, this awful, inhuman distance which would always be interposed between her and the other being! There was nothing to do but to lie still and endure. She felt an overwhelming tenderness for him, and a dark understirring of jealous hatred that he should lie so perfect and immune in an other world whilst she was tormented with violent wakefulness, cast out in the outer darkness. She lay in intense and vivid consciousness, an exhausting super-consciousness. The church clock struck the hours, it seemed to her, in quick succession. She heard them distinctly in the tension of her vivid consciousness and he slept, as if time were one moment, unchanging and unmoving. She was exhausted, wearied, yet she must continue in this state of violent, active super-consciousness. She was conscious of everything—her childhood, her girlhood, all the forgotten incidents, all the unrealised influences and all the happenings she had not understood pertaining to herself, to her family, to her friends, her lovers, her acquaintances, everybody. It was as if she drew a glittering rope of knowledge out of the sea of darkness, drew and drew and drew it out of the fathomless depths of the past, and still it did not come to an end. There was no end to it. She must haul and haul at the rope of glittering consciousness, pull it out phosphorescent from the endless depths of the unconsciousness, till she was weary, aching, exhausted and fit to break, and yet she had not done. Ah, if only she might wake him! She turned uneasily. When could she rouse him and send him away? When could she disturb him? And she relapsed into her activity of automatic consciousness, 
that would never end. But the time was drawing near when she could wake him. It was like a release. The clock had struck four, outside in the night. Thank God the night had passed almost away. At five he must go, and she would be released. Then she could relax and fill her own place. Now she was driven up against his perfect sleeping motion, like a knife white-hot on a grindstone. There was something monstrous about him, about his juxtaposition against her. The last hour was the longest. And yet at last it passed. Her heart leapt with relief. Yes, there was the slow, strong stroke of the church clock, at last, after this night of eternity. She waited to catch each slow, fatal reverberation. Three, four, five. There! It was finished. A weight rolled off her. She raised herself, leaned over him tenderly, and kissed him. She was sad to wake him. After a few moments she kissed him again, but he did not stir. The darling, he was so deep in sleep. What a shame to take him out of it. She let him lie a little longer. But he must go. He must really go. With full over-tenderness she took his face between her hands and kissed his eyes. The eyes opened. He remained motionless, looking at her. Her heart stood still. To hide her face from his dreadful opened eyes in the darkness, she bent down and kissed him, whispering, "'You must go, my love.' but she was sick with terror, sick. He put his arms round her. Her heart sank. But you must go, my love, it's late. What time is it? he said. Strange, his man's voice. She quivered. It was an intolerable oppression to her. Past five o'clock, she said but he only closed his arms round her again. Her heart cried within her in torture. She disengaged herself firmly. "'You really must go,' she said. "'Not for a minute,' he said. She lay still, nestling against him, but unyielding. "'Not for a minute,' he repeated, clasping her closer. "'Yes,' she said, unyielding. I'm afraid if you stay any longer." There was a certain coldness in her voice that made him release her, and she broke away, rose, and lit the candle. That then was the end. He got up. He was warm and full of life and desire, yet he felt a little bit ashamed, humiliated, putting on his clothes before her in the candlelight for he felt revealed, exposed to her, at a time when she was in some way against him. It was all very difficult to understand. He dressed himself quickly without collar or tie. Still he felt full and complete, perfected. She thought it humiliating to see a man dressing, the ridiculous shirt, the ridiculous trousers and braces. But again an idea saved her. "'It is like a workman getting up to go to work,' thought Gudrun, "'and I am like a workman's wife.' But an ache like nausea was upon her, a nausea of him. He pushed his collar and tie into his overcoat pocket, then he sat down and pulled on his boots. They were sodden, as were his socks and trouser-bottoms, but he himself was quick and warm. "'Perhaps you ought to have put your boots on downstairs,' she said. At once, without answering, he pulled them off again, and stood holding them in his hand. She had thrust her feet into slippers, and flung a loose robe round her. She was ready. She looked at him as he stood waiting, his black coat buttoned to the chin, 
his cap pulled down, his boots in his hand. And the passionate, almost hateful fascination revived in her for a moment. It was not exhausted. His face was so warm-looking, wide-eyed, and full of newness, so perfect. She felt old, old. She went to him heavily to be kissed. He kissed her quickly. She wished his warm, expressionless beauty did not so fatally put a spell on her, compel her, and subjugate her. It was a burden upon her that she resented but could not escape. Yet when she looked at his straight man's brows, and at his rather small, well-shaped nose, and at his blue, indifferent eyes, she knew her passion for him was not yet satisfied. Perhaps never could be satisfied. Only now she was weary, with an ache like nausea. She wanted him gone. They went downstairs quickly. It seemed they made a prodigious noise. He followed her as, wrapped in her vivid green wrap, she preceded him with the light. She suffered badly with fear lest her people should be roused. He hardly cared. He did not care now who knew. And she hated this in him. One must be cautious. One must preserve oneself. She led the way to the kitchen. It was neat and tidy as the woman had left it. He looked up at the clock. Twenty minutes past five. Then he sat down on a chair to put on his boots. She waited, watching his every movement. She wanted it to be over. It was a great nervous strain on her. He stood up. She unbolted the back door and looked out. A cold, raw night, not yet dawn, with a piece of a moon in the vague sky. She was glad she need not go out. "'Good-bye, then,' he murmured. "'I'll come to the gate,' she said. And again she hurried on in front to warn him of the steps. And at the gate once more she stood on the step, whilst he stood below her. "'Good-bye,' she whispered. He kissed her dutifully and turned away. She suffered torments, hearing his firm tread going so distinctly down the road. Ah, the insensitiveness of that firm tread! She closed the gate, and crept quickly and noiselessly back to bed. When she was in her room and the door closed, and all safe, she breathed freely, and a great weight fell off her. She nestled down in bed, in the groove his body had made, in the warmth he had left and excited, worn out, yet still satisfied, she fell soon into a deep, heavy sleep. Gerald walked quickly through the raw darkness of the coming dawn. He met nobody. His mind was beautifully still and thoughtless, like a still pool, and his body full and warm and rich. He went quickly along towards Shortlands, in a grateful self-sufficiency. End of chapter 24 Recording by Ruth Golding